Hi everyone, Cal Ewing here, and you are watching our third installment on private lending through your self-directed IRA. And I am thrilled to welcome back Derek Long of Hello. Quest Trust Company in Texas. And Derek, thank you so much for coming back. Um, awesome to have you on and share your knowledge and expertise here with us. Yeah, thank, thank you, Cal. Actually, I've had a lot of fun with these. These have been a lot of fun. It's been great educational-wise, and I really hope your viewers are starting to enjoy them as well. So, Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, uh, the first two videos, Derek did a really great job of, of explaining what a self-directed IRA is, um, the different types of retirement savings accounts. And then last time we went through how you can purchase real estate um, through your IRA and how you can partner in things. And today our goal is to talk to you more about private lending through your retirement accounts. So Derek, I'm just gonna hand it over to you and you can take it from here. Yeah, well, thanks Cal. So as he was stating, if uh, this uh, specific video is gonna be a little more advanced than some of the other ones, but so if you have questions or you're not following along, go back and watch video one or video two, all right? Because that's really gonna help lay the foundation for what we're gonna dive into right now. So I'm gonna do real quick, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my PowerPoint that I'm gonna be using, right? And ultimately, what we're gonna be talking about today, as Cal said, was lending from your IRA. Now, Cal, uh, can you see everything okay? Does that work? Oh uh, yeah, good to go. Perfect, so as, as I was saying, we're just lending from the IRA, but we always like to start with our little disclaimer. Me and Cal are here for educational purposes, right? No tax advice, legal advice, investment advice. It's, we're strictly here to help you guys. That's the purpose to this podcast. Now, as we go to dive into some of this, one of the first things we always like to talk about is how you can leverage each one of the retirement accounts, I'm going to say, within your family. So what people don't realize is you actually can partner all of these IRAs together, and it could be IRAs and 401ks, et cetera. So if I think of someone like myself, I have a retirement account, but so does my spouse, and so do my parents. So if I found an investment that's maybe, I'm gonna say a higher end investment, I can actually bring all of our accounts together as one and do that individual investment. So that's why I always like to bring that up. And since we're talking about lending, most of the time we're gonna to lend to a fix and flipper, maybe lend to a joint venture, maybe lend to a private company. So in order for us to be lending to these individuals, we have to really look at the lender's perspective. You know, how can I protect myself? How, what do I get out of it? What are the steps to go through this process? So uh, I kind of put together some do's and don'ts. So this is both gonna be positives and negatives, right? But the first thing I always like to talk about is you never want to lend on something you don't want to own. Great example is in my family, we did a loan one time to a, uh, it's funny because they were a cute couple. They were great with animals. They were building this animal uh, like dog thing where people could drop off their dogs and it was just a big kennel service pretty much. Well, long story short, we had to foreclose on them and we ended up with a dog kennel. I don't know what to do with a dog kennel. You know, so is that your part-time job now, Derek, is running the kennel? <laughs> no, actually it was really difficult. We had to get someone else to manage it and sell off. The, it, was, it was a pain. But understand that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to be a real estate investor, right? In which in most of the people watching this podcast is what you've been looking at doing. And so make sure if you're going to lend to someone, you know what you're lending on and you know what to do if something goes wrong. So you don't lend on something you don't want to own, okay? When it comes to working with fix and flippers, you don't want to advance all the repairs sometimes, right, all at once. Well, this makes sense when you think about it, because normally if a contractor approaches you, they say here, you're gonna pay half up front, and half, you know, when you're finished, when we're finished. So why wouldn't you be, do the same thing? If you're asking to borrow my money, okay? I'm gonna take it from my IRA and I'm gonna lend it to you at a certain percentage, but I may not have to lend you all of it up front. We may be able to do it in draws, which a lot of times makes sense, okay? Last, time, last thing real fast is you don't loan to someone you feel uncomfortable for closing on. Best example is uh, recently we had a client uh, back in November, he did a loan to his brother, right? Well, his brother, the deal didn't go quite as planned and he had to foreclose on him. How awkward do you think Christmas was having to foreclose on little old brother? So these are just some of the things to consider. 
uh, as we move forward, I think I have a total of 10 or 11 of these in here, right? If the loan goes into default, you don't delay. This is so, so crucial. We have a lot of clients that once their lender or their borrower quits making payments to them, they don't know what to do. So they actually get scared and they just don't go after them. They don't do anything. So we always say it's not starting the foreclosure process, okay? It's usually just making a phone call, you know, stating, hey, where's my payment? You know, you need to make a payment to me. And if they can't or they don't respond or something along those lines, it might be, start, uh, might be time to start that foreclosure process. And uh, obviously you bring in an attorney and they help you out usually with that, but you know what to do. Once again, it falls back to rule one, don't loan on something you don't wanna own. You know, collect interest monthly. <laughs> so I did a loan one time and I'll never do it again. I was really, really lucky because I knew the guy, uh, I trusted him, all right? And because of this, he brought me a deal and it was uh, a 0% interest loan, but he'll give me 20% equity in the proper, property once they sell it. Well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. So I gave him a loan. This was back in August of 2017. I live in Houston, Texas. Do you know what happened in September of 2017, Cal? Things went bad. Things uh, got a little wet. Yes, things got extremely wet here. We got hit with Hurricane Harvey. Now, luckily my friend, he called me and he let me know, hey, the house got flooded. We can't sell the house. And he ended up getting a, a year and a half free interest loan from me because that was how we structured the deal. All right. Mm -hmm. The guy is a good guy. Right. Uh, ultimately, it took a year and a half for him to sell the property and get everything done. And I got my money back. But a year and a half free interest loan. I could have done that better, you know? So understanding when you go to startup and you're starting to become a real estate investor and you want to be a lender, it makes sense to collect monthly interest rate or at least quarterly interest rate. If you're not collecting those, collect some points up front. Make the borrower understand like, hey, look, you're an individual and you need to be receiving something consistently, okay? If you're uninsured about the loan, hire a professional. So this, for me, I'm young. I always tell people this because when I work with a lot of people that are experts in this field, they're usually a lot older than like me or Cal. You know, like we're dealing with people that are in their 60s usually, and they've been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. Well, it makes sense sometimes to bring in someone as a friend, as a favor, and ask them. So, so for me, this is actually my dad. My dad has been a private lender professionally for almost 20 years. So when I have questions about the loan or I don't understand something, I bring them in. And you know what he tells me every single time? Suck it up, pay the 300 bucks to the attorney, and let the attorney answer those questions. Right. So, yep. it makes sense, you know? As we keep moving forward, uh, remember, as we talk about all of these little methods, and this is just from a lender's perspective, I am personally loaning from an IRA. The reason I do this is because my IRA is where the majority of my capital is, right? I don't keep a lot of money in my checking account. All of that money gets funneled to my retirement account. I don't keep a savings account. I have it all either in a checking or there. So since the majority of my capital is sitting in my personal Roth IRA, when I'm lending to someone, I'm lending from this account. Now this could be your 401k, this could be that IRA, this could be whatever that retirement account is that you have. Well, right. as we keep going forward, few more things just to consider is always get title insurance, right? This is really great because unfortunately, a lot of people will uh, say, hey, you have a first lien position. Hey, you have a first lien position. And really, there's two or three other people that have a first lien position. And because you didn't get title insurance, you could get hurt, you know? If it's necessary, make sure they have some sort of hazard insurance and flood insurance and fire insurance and any other type of insurances that could ultimately help secure your loan, okay? Insist on evidence that the property taxes of this place has been paid. Uh, hasn't happened to me personally, but there has been several cases where someone has not paid the property taxes, they've taken a loan out from someone else, and the city themselves have foreclosed on the property, and they ended up with the house, and the lender gets cut out. So, uh, last thing, get a personal guarantee if 
possible. Now I say this because a lot of times a personal guarantee, you don't really need one, especially if you're in a first lien position, you have title insurance, you have a deed of trust, right? All that's in your name or your IRA's name. But recently I did a second lien loan. I've, I did what's called gap funding. I provided gap funding to someone else who just needed a small amount of funds. Well, on that, I didn't get a first lien position, so it made sense to the, ask the individual for a personal guarantee, which they were able to fill out, right? If they trust themselves enough, that makes sense. So as we uh, continue on through, I wanted to put up one of the promissory notes that uh, I've done. And if we look here, you can see there's a whole bunch of lenders in this, right? So this is a real promissory note that we did. We have uh, Patricia and Forrest Clark. This is my uncle, my dad, Nathan, my uncle, Quincy, and then my mom, and my dad as well, along with our executive vice president. Now, when we look at the percentages of the notes right up here, right, we have 27%, 18%, 20%, et cetera. Notice we brought a bunch of individuals together for one note, and that is how we structure the loan to send it out to an individual. So it's just something just kind of for there. The next slide is just more about the note, kind of what the property was and those type of things. So honestly, I'm, there, Derek? Huh? I'm just going to stop you there and ask sure. a question. So all of those people that are on the loan, they're sharing that lien position. So there's not one person getting paid out first, correct? Everyone gets paid out at once, right? That's correct. So understand that each one of these individuals own their percentage of the first lien position. So if, let's say worst case scenario, you had to foreclose, all right? One of these individuals on this list would probably take the lead of that, you know, whoever's the most experienced, in this case would probably be Forrest Clark, only because he is an attorney. And he would go ahead and go through the foreclosure process and then all the money would be distributed back to each of the IRAs to that percentage that you see there on the screen. So that's a good question. So anything else before I move forward? No, nope, I think we're good. Boom. I like to call these kind of simple loans just because they're very simplistic, right? Uh, there's a fixed monthly amount that's due, right? I don't have to deal with tenants and toilets, all right? So these I think are all advantages is understand that if I want to be a private lender, lender, it's very easy. It takes honestly about a day or two to draw up a note and you're done. I lend the money, I get my return back that I've agreed upon, that I enjoy, that I like, right? I make sense to me. And I don't have to deal with day-to-day -day operations, you know, which I think, especially someone like me, I have a W-2 job. I, uh, I get paid very well, so I don't have any desire in quitting anytime soon. So for me, this makes sense to be a lender, you know? To be honest, I lend my funds out at 1% a month, if you average that out, that's 12% a year. I can't get 12% in a CD or a mutual fund or it's really, really hard to get that even in a stock, yeah. you know? So 12% a year, I enjoy being a private lender, lender, but there are some disadvantages. So this is what I like to always bring up as a disadvantage is the borrower has control, okay? Understand that I'm giving my money to a borrower. Now I have securities, that's why we drew up the note. That's why we went to attorney and had the title policies and all those 10 uh, things that I went over earlier, right? But the borrower ultimately has my money and they do what they need to with it, okay? Next is you'll probably get less out of the deal than what the borrower is making. Now this makes sense because they're the one doing all the work. They're the one taking on all the hassle. They're the ones going through this process. Right, they're dealing with the contractors, they're dealing with tenants and toilets, they're dealing with day-to-day -day operations. You're a lender. So because you're not dealing with that, you're not gonna get as big of a return, right, as usually, let's say, the fix and flipper. Right, a fix and flipper will probably make upwards of 50, 60%, but that's why they're doing it, right? Yeah. You also don't get any of the advantages of owning the real estate. Understand, if it's a long-term deal, like a rental property or something, I don't get to claim depreciation. I don't get to claim expenses on my taxes, but it's because once again, I'm the lender. I'm not dealing with those day-to-day -day operations. So a lot of people look at these things right here on the screen as disadvantages. I don't wanna deal with that stuff. I don't wanna vet contractors. I don't wanna deal with tenants and toilets. You know, and it's funny, I'd actually rather give my money to someone like you, Cal, right, and let you deal with that stuff, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So 
I and always say when you got a job and, and a life, right? It's not your it, you know. exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's I have my own life. I have my own job. I have my own stuff I deal with on day to days. I don't want to deal with this stuff, right? I always say being a private lender is just another tool. You want to use it like a tool, right? But use it wisely, you know, and that's pretty much it. So that, that's, that's what I had to go over, Cal, uh, as far as being a lender, some of the advantages of it. I know you have some slides as well, though, that because uh, you have some great examples that I, I didn't have. Yeah. Yeah, Derek. I was gonna. I'm gonna share a case study here. Um, so I've I've been on both sides of the coin, as I think you may have too, as being an investor and a lender, depending yeah. on the deal. So you and I both have that experience of being a borrow and, and borrower and being a lender, and so it's nice that we can see both perspectives, right? So I'm gonna share a, a case study here of a deal that we've done, and I'd like your your comments and feedback as far as a uh, perspective from a an IRA lender or a retirement yeah. fund lender. Okay, so um, can you see my screen here, Derek? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna reiterate a little bit more uh, about what you said as far as some of the benefits. Um, and one thing about being a lender is you have control over what projects and properties you lend on and the people you work with. And this goes back to what you were saying in video two, I think, Derek, with like, um, you know, when you're investing in say mutual funds or something like that, you don't really know where your money is going, who it's, who's using it. Um, you're not involved in the decisions at all. And the cool thing about being a private lender is you can choose the projects. And like you say, like if it's something that you would want to own, if things were to go bad, you get to choose that. You get to yeah. choose your borrower, right? So that's a lot I, of freedom. I think that's a big advantage. Yeah. And the other cool thing is you get to involve yourself in projects that better your city or state or country or neighborhood, depending on where the project is, right? So you might be able to lend on a home that's in your neighborhood that's being you know, repaired. And so you get to be involved in bettering the neighborhood, right? Bettering your oh, community, yeah. which is a really cool thing. Um, and then you're also helping people, right? So you're, you're taking a dilapidated house, for example, and you're helping improve it by lending on the project. And then you're providing homes for people in your neighborhood. Um, you're reducing crime because there's one less, you know, worn down property maybe. And you're also increasing property values in that neighborhood because it's, it's bringing all the values of the homes up. Um, and it's also, like you said last time, Derek, it's something that a lot of people understand better. Um, you know, like we all live in homes, so we, we kind of have that understanding of what a home is and what's involved. Whereas some of these other stocks and things like that, it can be really complicated. Um, and yeah, unless you put a lot of time, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so there's a lot of advantages to lending on real estate just because of these things. Um, and then there's also the human element. And I'm going to share a little bit of the human side of this uh, in this case study here with you. So this is a deal my company did in Lake Jackson, Texas, uh, just a few months ago, actually. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story behind this and how we're really helping people, both us as the real estate investor and our private lender. Um, so I got a call from a gentleman that I used to work with, actually. I used to be in oil and gas, and I worked with him for about a year, and he called me up out of the blue a few months ago and told me that his dad needed help and that he was going into foreclosure and he was about to lose his house. Um, so I guess this gentleman was laid off. Um, he was older, so he couldn't find a job because he said because of his age and his industry, they're really just hiring younger people. Um, so he'd been out of work for a year and the, the bank finally said, like, we've had enough. You've been missing payments and we're going to foreclose on you. Okay. Um, and he thought that, you know, listing it with a real estate agent was not an option because the home needed repairs and it was just a slow process and he needed a quick fix to save this house from going into foreclosure. Um, and so we looked at the deal and, you know, we figured that it, the equity in the property wasn't enough that we could actually do a, a renovation, like a fix and flip, like you'd mentioned, Derek. Um, so we had a, another cool strategy, and this is a little bit of a longer term private lending strategy I want to share with you. So what we did is we um, have a, a young couple that we know that actually recently immigrated from Poland, um, and they'd done some real estate, but they, they've been struggling. They had both full-time jobs, and they were trying to figure out how to be landlords and how to do some fix and flips and stuff, and they'd really been struggling getting their business going. 
Um, and they were getting poor returns on their other investments as well. So they were looking for a way to get ahead. They loved real estate, but they weren't really successful in getting their own properties. So they saw this deal and wanted to lend on it as a private lender. Okay. So here's just an example uh, of some of the numbers. Okay. So we agreed to buy the home for what was owed on the mortgage. Okay. Um, and basically we were going to pay off everything um, that was owed and stop the foreclosure. Okay. So that amount ended up being 106.6. Okay. Um, and we figured out what's that? I said, sounds good so far. Yeah. And we figured out that the after repair value, if we were to do a, a full remodel, was about 160. Okay. And so we brought in our private lender um, and we were offering 8% um, over five years. Okay. So this is a bit of a longer term. This isn't like you were saying, Derek, where it's a short fix and flip. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they were going to make $711 uh, monthly in interest. Okay. So this is cash flow coming to them every month, like you had said. Um, and this is cash flow that they don't need to worry about saving part of it for repairs or saving part of it if a toilet breaks or a vacancy, right? They're a lender, so they can spend this extra cash flow, this interest payment right away, right? Which is really cool for them. Um, and over five years, they're going to earn $42,640, okay? And that's, again, in first lien position, like you'd mentioned earlier, Derek, okay? And the cool thing is the loan to value um, on this property, meaning the amount that we borrowed to purchase it um, against how much the, the property's worth, the loan to value ratio was 67%. So there's a lot of equity behind that loan in case something were to go bad, right? And I think this is really important when you're considering lending is what's your security and what's your loan to value, right? Um, people that lend 100% of what the property's worth, if something goes bad, that's where you really get in a situation where you could lose money, right, Derek? I would say definitely for sure. The problem, I haven't actually yet had to experience that myself, but honestly, the only reason I haven't had to experience that myself is strictly because I have a, a lot of people I can contact and help me out, such as yourself, so. Right. But, Okay, so the next slide here. Um, so then what we were doing, there just wasn't room to buy this property cheap enough to do a fix and flip um, because they, the seller owed so much on his loan. Uh, we ended up owner financing this property to a new end buyer, okay? So we actually, we borrowed the money to purchase the house, okay? And then we turned around, once we owned it, we're actually selling it again with owner financing to another person, okay? And this is really cool. This lady here, her name is Lynn, and her previous home um, got flooded during Hurricane Harvey, okay? It wasn't in a flood zone, all right? So she didn't have flood insurance. She didn't need flood insurance. Um, and it was hit with so much water that it actually knocked her house off its foundation a few inches. And that's because um, in Houston, they actually released some of the reservoirs to save the whole city, they sacrificed some neighborhoods in order to save they the entire city. Burned on a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So areas flooded that wouldn't have normally flooded, and her home unfortunately happened to be in one of those areas. So to make matters worse for her, um, she ended up having to pay for the repairs out of her own pocket, um, and she gave the contractor a very big down payment, not knowing better, um, and he skipped town with the money. So she lost around 100000 from the contractor, plus her entire home was flooded and she couldn't live in it. So she ended up getting foreclosed on herself and losing her home. And now her credit was in a very bad, yeah. And her credit was in awful shape because of that. And so she had no hope in getting a, a traditional bank mortgage. So we were able to help her by basically becoming her private lender um, and, and owner financing the home to her. Okay, when because she had a great income, you know, everything was great about her situation, except her credit score was bad and she just encountered some really bad luck. So we were able to get her into this home. All right. So she's excited right now. She's bought this home and her plans are to fix it up. Okay. So our owner finance sale price on this property was 162000 Okay. And she gave us a 10% down payment 
And we did this loan with, with her advertised over 30 years. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So it's kind of cool because there's we have a, our own private lender to buy the home, and then we are becoming a private lender ourselves, owner financing it to the end buyer. So there's actually two two private lenders in this deal, which is kind of cool. Um, so we're collecting 1280 a month uh, from her in a, a mortgage payment, and she's actually paying less than what this property would rent for by a few dollars. Okay, so she's able to own a home with bad credit for about the cost of rent. Okay, so that's our strategy with this. And what we love about this is um, it's a win, 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 win type of a deal. <laughs> I was going to say something like that. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, so um, our seller wins because he was able to stop the foreclosure. Um, he didn't walk away with anything at the end, but his credit was saved. Um, and when you go through a foreclosure, a lot of times you can't even get a cell phone. Um, buying a car with financing is probably not going to happen for about seven years. So he was able to save his credit, taking a nasty hit, and he gets a, a new start. Okay. Our end buyer obviously wins. Um, she had had some seriously bad luck and had no hope of getting a mortgage right away. Um, so she's able to start over in a new home that she's excited about, and we're able to be her lender on this. Our, um, my company as the investor, uh, we win because we're getting a really good cash flow from this property, okay? And what we're doing is we're collecting the difference between what our end buyer is paying us and what we're paying our private lender. So it's kind of like being a landlord except no headaches of being a landlord, right? Okay, so we're doing well. And then the neighborhood wins because this home, you know, if they'd have gone into foreclosure, it would be sitting vacant for quite a few months. It maybe, maybe would have gotten broken into. And also, a lot of times when um, there's foreclosures and the banks take over the, the property in an REO, um, a lot of times they'll sell it for, for less than market value, and it actually brings the, the values of the homes down. That. Right? So that saves the neighborhood from maybe taking a little bit of a, a value drop as well. And then, of course, our private lender that we use to buy this property and do this deal, um, they're winning as well because they're getting a reliable monthly income okay, uh, at a rate that they're very happy with, and it's quite a bit more than they were making in their other investments. okay. And so they're getting an extra income every month that they can spend without having to save you know, for vacancy and repairs and the like. So um, as I say, it, I'll go ahead. I'll let you continue. No, go ahead. I'd like to hear it. Go for it. I say uh, this strategy you use, the owner financing strategy, is actually very, we see a lot with people's retirement accounts, strictly because A, it's a long-term investment. So if you think of someone around our age, Cal, uh, you know, we're, we're not retiring tomorrow or the next day. So a 20-year, 30-year return of 8% on your money is incredible, yep. really, especially since it's consistent. Real, even more important than that, your money is secure. You know, if anything was to happen, you have a property to fall back on. So that's all I was going to say. Yeah. Know? And and my point is there's different ways to do this as a lender. Um, you can do the short-term fix and flips. Um, usually you're going to ask for a higher interest rate, right, Derek? Um, yeah. But I guess one downside of that is sometimes you're going to have gaps in between projects, right, where your money might not be doing anything. Um, so for some people, it's more beneficial to lock into something, say, like this, where they're making a little bit less, but it's consistent the whole five years that they're lending on the deal, right? So it's really what you can negotiate with your borrower and what makes sense to you and your goals. And, and you, you nailed it perfectly, too, because, uh, like, I told you I was ch charging 12% earlier, but that was on a very short-term note. It was usually around four to six months. Yeah. Well, then there's still another month or two I'm not receiving anything because I have to find the next deal. Exactly. You know? and, and so, so I'm not really getting my 12%. You know, it's just what it's labeled as. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point. Sorry, I'll let you continue. Yeah, sure. I, I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to go over the, the two possible outcomes as a private lender, um, whether it's a, a fix and flip or something more like this. Um, plan A is what you sign up for, right? So it's to collect your payment from your borrower uh, paying on the loan, right? So it's to collect your monthly interest payment, okay? Um, and that's if everything goes smoothly, which you hope it will, you assume it will. Um, but the cool thing about being a lender is if you do it right and you set up the loan right, plan B can almost be <laughs> more in your benefit um, because you, you're able to foreclose and take a home 
that's probably worth 30 to 50% more than your loan, right? And this is what I was getting at with the loan to value. Um, if the amount of money you're lending is substantially less than the value of the home, uh, if you did unfortunately have to foreclose on your borrower, you're getting an asset that's worth more than what you invested, right? Always. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's getting back to what you said, Derek, is you don't want to foreclose on something that you don't know what to do with. But if it's if you know what to do with a home, if you had to take it, um, you could either turn around and sell it or keep it as a rental or do an owner finance like this. Yes. Yeah, right. So it's got a lot of benefits that way as well. Okay. So I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, yeah, so I hope that you guys got a few ideas about how you could lend out of your retirement accounts. Um, because that's kind of the goal of this series was to talk about private lending on real estate. So this wraps up our mini series on how to set up your self-directed IRA and ultimately take control of your retirement by being able to put your money into investments that make sense for you. Um, things that you understand, things you maybe have an interest or a passion in, such as real estate, and ultimately growing your returns bigger um, while having more control in what your money's invested in. So with that, I'd like to offer you a free 30-minute strategy session, either on the phone or through Zoom on a video call. And I can help you get started, whatever that next step might be for you. So if that's uh, setting up a self-directed IRA account or finding deals to either purchase as investment properties through your IRA, partnering with other investors, um, finding borrowers and investors to lend on as far as uh, private lending on real estate. Any of those things, I'm happy to help you get going. Uh, if there's any questions you might have as far as anything that we've covered in this series, I'd be happy to get your questions answered so that ultimately when you're done the call, you'll know what your next step is and hopefully you'll have a roadmap that you can follow so that you can get investing through your self-directed IRA account and start making bigger returns. All right, so there should be a link or a button below this video. Feel free to click on that and you'll be taken to my calendar page and you can set up a time that works for you and your schedule and we can have our free strategy session. So I look forward to speaking with you then and uh, good luck with your investments. I'm here to help. Just reach out. Talk to you soon. I'm Cal Ewing.